words of power because we are kings and our words matter. This man I like very much because he comes, he understands exactly what Jesus is preaching about. He understands this is exactly what is missing in his life. This is exactly what he needs. He is very uh, direct about his question. He says, how, what should I do to inherit eternal life? You are my heart. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in to the kingdom of God. First, let me remind you what kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God, the simplest way to think about the kingdom of God is this. It's the rulership of God in the lives of men. It is in this sense that Jesus said that the kingdom of God has come. It's in your heart. Uh, he's not referring to the kingdom, the literal kingdom that is going to come where he's going to establish his rulership over the earth and all of that. He's talking about uh, this kingdom that has come in the hearts of people who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. See, when you get saved, you have not only received him as your Savior for the forgiveness of your sin, for your redemption, that's Savior, but you have also received him as Lord. I don't know if everybody realizes that. You are saying that Jesus is my Lord. He is my King. He will rule, after me, rule over me hereafter. He, uh, my rule ends and his rule begins from this day. That's what Christian life is all about. That's when a person truly becomes a Christian. 
So when you understand kingdom of God in that way, it's very easy to understand some of the Bible passages immediately. Otherwise, you'll think kingdom of God is some strange thing, you know. Kingdom of God is nothing but the rulership of God in the lives of men. It began when you got saved. Jesus came into your life. He became the king. He's ruling in your heart. His will is being done in your life, not your will anymore. You are walking according to his ways and doing his will. And therefore, uh, your family, the work that you do, everything kind of becomes like a kingdom entity. Uh, this is how the kingdom of God works. Now, so when you think about the kingdom of God, you can think of it as the Christian life or being born again or becoming a Christian. Uh, uh, all of this uh, can be thought about as you entering into the kingdom of God. When you get saved, you are entering into the kingdom of God. The kingdom is entering into you. So this is a simple way to understand the kingdom. All right? Now, going from here, we started looking at various passages that talk about the kingdom to understand what the kingdom is all about. Because the kingdom of God is totally unlike anything that you have heard on this earth. It's totally different. Even people in Jesus' days couldn't understand. Even the disciples of Jesus couldn't understand what the kingdom of God was. Again and again, Jesus had to explain to them so many misunderstandings concerning the kingdom of God. I believe even today it is so that people have a difficulty understanding the kingdom of God because it is not a, a thing that uh, you can just uh, uh, relate to something in this earth. It is totally unlike anything that you have on this earth. Therefore, it is a, bit, it, it is a little difficult to understand this. But I think uh, by the, through the word of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, we can really understand this. Once you understand new birth, salvation, and all of that, it is easy to understand this. And so we have taken so many passages from the Bible sh talking about the kingdom of God so that we talked about one passage at a time, clearing many misunderstandings and doubts and bringing some clarity so that we can see what it is to enter the kingdom, how the kingdom enters into us, how it works in us, how we enjoy the benefits of the kingdom, how we live in this kingdom. All of these things, all of these details become available through these uh, passages that we've been dealing with. A lot of it is about how to enter into the kingdom of God, enter into this life, this Christian life. So today I read to you this passage. This passage is one of the very familiar passages to a lot of people, but at the same time, it is one of the most misunderstood passages. Um, this passage has been used widely for so many years for Christians to teach against uh, uh, any kind of riches. I, I was born and raised in this thing. So this is the way I've heard this verse most of the time. They said, whatever happens, make sure you don't have any riches. Because if you have riches, you're not going to go to heaven. That's how they interpreted this. Where Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They've taken it. And when he said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. They've taken these verses. And I'm talking about traditionally how it has been interpreted and understood in the modern church. They said, make sure you don't have any riches because riches can really take you to hell. Uh, if you have riches, you can't go to heaven. So they kind of made it sound like whatever it is, one of the great qualifications you must have to go to heaven is that you don't have riches. That's very sad. Because that is not what this passage is teaching at all. This passage is not teaching. The point of this whole passage, talking about riches also, but the point of the whole passage is not to knock riches and tell you that if you have riches, you won't go to heaven. I'll show you that by the time it's over. You will understand that. Now, what is the point then? The point of this whole thing is there's a terrible misunderstanding about how a person enters into the kingdom of God and how the kingdom comes into a person. And this passage is clearing that. Here is a young man, a rich young man coming to Jesus with the same kind of misunderstanding that modern people have today. And Jesus is dealing with that young man and showing him what? See, we already saw one of those weeks, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, we studied about how the unrighteous will not enter into the kingdom of God, right? That means the bad won't enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the point, whole point of this passage is to show how 
it is not good to be just moral and your goodness and morality is not enough to enter into the kingdom of God. That is the whole point of this discussion here that Jesus has with this young man. It is not about money. It could be anything. For this young man, it was money. It could be anything that stands in the way of a person entering into the kingdom of God. Jesus is simply using money because money is a very important uh, uh, thing, you know. Uh, that is why a lot of times I also preach about it because it highlights many things, you know. And Jesus is using money because that money is his problem, this man's problem. And I'll show you today that for some other people, there are some other problems that is keeping them from the kingdom of God. So the issue is not just the money here. The issue is how a person's goodness and morality is not able to take him into the kingdom of God. We'll see it as we go and uh, look at this thing. But here... Uh, this young man strikes me, uh, the situation, whole situation will strike everybody as a strange situation because here is a young man who comes literally very eagerly. The story begins in chapter uh, 10, verse 17. I read to you only from 23 to 25 just to make it short. But the story actually begins in verse 17 where it is said that now as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So here is a man, just imagine this, he is coming to Jesus, he is coming asking a question, how do I e inherit eternal life? If you read the whole thing, the, the particular passage, verse 17 to 19, for example, you know, like for, uh, for example, verse 18 says, so Jesus said to him, said to this young man, why do you call me good? No one is good because he said good master, right? So Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, you, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then only Jesus looks at the disciples, and makes the comment that we just read from verse 23, that it's hard for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. But here is a young man that is coming to Jesus. By the story, by what this passage tells us about him, he seems like a very decent, moral, good young man. Because when Jesus listed all the commandments, this young man says, from my youth, I've been following these things. Here is a man who's following the commandments of God, who's living a decent life. He's not stealing, he's not killing, he's not committing adultery, he's not doing all these things uh, uh, that uh, some people do, you know. You can't accuse him of any of these things. He says, I've been following this very carefully. I'm living by this. So he's a decent, moral young man. But all of a sudden, something has awakened in him. There is a spiritual awakening happening in him. That even though he's a good and moral man, and probably believed all this time that to be good and moral is enough. If you're good and moral, you're already in the kingdom. This is one serious misunderstanding that a lot of people have. If you're a good person, decent person, moral person, you're already in the kingdom. You know, people will tell you that in no time, you know. So what are you talking about? I'm in the kingdom. I'm a Christian. My name is George. And I'm moral and I'm good. I've not stolen. I've not uh, done this, that, and all these things, you know. You can't uh, pinpoint anything wrong with me. I'm a good person, moral person. So I am in the kingdom. The, the wrong idea is if you're moral and good, then you're naturally, you're in the kingdom, you know. That's the way they think. And Jesus has a conversation with this guy and through the conversation shows him that it is not enough to be just moral and good. And this man realizes it. That's the main thing. He comes to Jesus knowing that he was a moral man and a good man, but now he has come under an awakening, a realization that tells him in his heart to be moral and good is not enough. There is something more than just moral and being moral and good. How did he come to know that? I believe that he, he's been hearing Jesus. Because he comes and asks about how to receive eternal life. Where did he hear that? 
Jesus was preaching about eternal life. So he's been hearing the sermons of Jesus and something has awakened in him. He began to see. I can imagine, see, this is the thing. You have to extract this out of this, you know, literally. I can imagine what Jesus has been teaching to these people because they believed in their morality and their goodness to get them through to heaven and all of that, you know. And I can see Jesus showing them that it's not enough. And this man got the message. And uh, so he, after hearing Jesus, he has come to a conclusion that even though he's moral and good, that is not enough. He needs something more than that. And that something more is what Jesus has been teaching, that is eternal life. And he wants to inherit that eternal life. He knows that he's missing something very serious. He, is, he knows that this is not an ordinary thing. This is something very serious. He needs it. This is the thing lacking. Nobody else is teaching about it. All the Pharisees are not teaching about it. Scribes are not teaching about eternal life. They're only teaching, saying, you obey this commandment, that commandment, and this verse and that verse. But nobody is talking anything about eternal life. So what is this eternal life? He realizes in his heart, I need this eternal life. So he comes to Jesus. The way he comes, the Bible says, he came running. That's very interesting. He came running means, <laughs> the Bible says that. Verse 17 tells us that he came running. Now, came running means this problem seems very big to him. He wants to attend to it. Now, when people begin to understand that they got a problem, some, until they understand that this is a serious problem, they don't come running. Probably invited somebody to come to church. They're in problem. They need Jesus. What did they tell you? They say, well, I'll come next month for sure. This month it's very hot. You know, next month it'll be cooling down a little bit. So I will come next month. Some for, because the man postpones it by a month or a week or even a day or even a few hours because he thinks this is, he is not convinced that this is an urgent problem. Once you realize, see, it's like going to a doctor, you know, when you realize you got a sickness and you got to attend to it immediately, in fact, you needed to attend to it one month ago, already you've delayed it, and by delaying it, you know, you're risking your life. You would want to fix an appointment with the doctor immediately. You will catch a hold of somebody, get a good doctor, you know, call up and want to see him today, right now. Where are you? I'll come, you know. That's the approach you'll take. And that's the kind of approach this man is taking. He has not only understood that he's got a problem, that he's good and moral, but that's not enough. For the first time in his life, he sees good and moral is not enough. He needs eternal life. And he sees that it's a big problem. It cannot be postponed till tomorrow or the next hour. He needs to attend to it right away. And he cannot even delay it by a few seconds. Therefore, he runs to Jesus and comes and says, uh, comes to Jesus running. And then it says, not only did he run, See, the running and coming to Jesus not only uh, tells us that he understood the seriousness of the problem, but he did something about it. It's important to do something about it. But the thing is, then it says he kneeled down before Jesus. Now, this is something. He's a rich man. He's a man who's got some uh, status in society. He comes and kneels down before Jesus because he recognizes that Jesus is not an ordinary man. He's not just another ordinary teacher. He's just an extraordinary, amazing teacher. He's teaching something that nobody has ever taught, and his heart is now yearning for it. And he knows that this is the only man that can tell me more about it. This is the only man. I want to be like him. I want to get what he's got. I like what is in him. And I want to receive this. That's the approach he's taking. So he comes and kneels down because he's got a great admiration and respect for Jesus and what he's been preaching and what he's offering uh, by way of spiritual life. So he comes and kneels, shows respect, right? Now, then he puts forth the question very clearly. Now, that uh, aspect you got to like, because a lot of people come, they have got a problem, but they won't just ask you the question about uh, actually what they, they don't recognize what they really need, like this man. He comes and says, Master, good master, what should I do to inherit eternal life. He knows exactly what he needs. He knows exactly what Jesus is telling in his preaching. He knows exactly what he needs to get. So he gets right to the point. He says, what should I do to inherit eternal life? But a lot of people are different. You know, they, they'll come. First of all, they don't understand they, that eternal life is what they want. They'll come and ask about, brother, in Revelation, there is 666. 
what is that you tell me now is that your big problem today yeah. 666 <laughs> what's your problem i asked some people what's your problem let's get to the problem let's not be talking about six no brother i just wanted to know about this antichrist this guy is not even saved yet just uh, you know he thinks uh, he, he knows that there is something in here something good he sees but he's got all these uh, questions about all these things and he's confused in his mind he cannot really pinpoint what he wants or what uh, is being offered by the christian faith and so on he comes and sits there he likes the worship he likes the feeling and so on so he doesn't even know how to ask the right question so he asks some question like that or some question from the bible or something like that from philosoph from from the philosophical view of life and so on and and, and just goes on and on about it but this man i like very much because he comes he understands exactly what jesus is preaching about he understands this is exactly what is missing in his life this is exactly what he needs he is very uh, direct about his question he says how what should i do to inherit eternal life now you got to like this man he comes running he comes kneeling huh? and he comes asking the right question Jesus loves him. The Bible says in verse 21, he says, Jesus looked at him and he loved him, it says, literally. How can he not love this man? If anybody came to church running and came kneeling <laughs> and came asking the right question, I would love that man also because here's a good candidate. Here's a perfect candidate to enter into the kingdom. Here is the right kind of guy. This is the kind of guy you've been fishing for, looking for. Here is the kind of guy that you want to see every day. You wish that you'd see more of them. And here he is, the perfect candidate for it, for uh, kingdom of God. But yet, having come so enthusiastically and uh, so eagerly, in the end, after his conversation with Jesus, he goes home, the Bible says, he was sad at the words of Jesus. All is it. Air has been let off. He came very eagerly, but at the end of the conversation, this encounter that he had with Jesus, he was sad at the words of Jesus, verse 22 says, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, what did Jesus tell him that upset him so much? Why did he go away? Now, that's what I'm going to look at because only when you understand that, you understand what kind of misunderstanding people even today have about the kingdom of God and what Jesus is trying to get across to all of us through this whole incident. Why it is rec recorded. Obviously, the apostle, you know, Mark has heard it told by Peter. Mark has been following him and, and it had been to, uh, this story has been told by Peter for probably so many times and he's heard it and Peter teaching from it and expounding upon this story and teaching Christian truths and so he wrote it in the gospel eh? so there is a reason for why it's there so that there is a lesson there for all of us and uh, when you understand this when you look at why this man who came so eagerly went away so sadly sorrowful what was the issue there? Then you will understand what the kingdom of God is all about. What did Jesus say to this man that upset him so much? In verse 21 it says, Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go away, uh, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then Jesus looks around to the disciples and says what he says about how it's hard for the rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me? I'm 
hands, O oh Lord.